Great. Finally, we've made it. Uh, lovely, Crystal, to, to have you on, on this um, series. Um, can't believe it. We're now on something like episode 89 or something like that of, of conversations that I just have with people who are either know already through collaborations or know through um, social media, it's my my mapping of important work that is going on. And, and you're definitely one, one of those people and, and the Post Growth Institute is, um, I know Donnie a little bit, Donnie's been on this show. Um, and, and so I've, yeah, I've always respected your work and I'm really glad that you have the time so we can have a conversation. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. So, like, normally I start off with this question that is, is quite personal and you can also take it wherever you want to take it, um, which is is really what got you into this work? What, like, when did you realize that having a profession for you was much, much more than just having something to earn the income that you want to spend um, kind of thing? And and what what, mm. what made you decide to do this work in this way? Hmm, wonderful question. Thank you. Um, I'd love to begin. Uh, I feel so like rooted to land. I'd love to just begin uh, letting people know uh, where where I'm from and where I live. Um, I grew up in Vermont on the east coast of the U.S. in a very small town of 700 people. So <laughs> really grew up uh, uh, in nature uh, in, in the 80s uh, there. And then uh, I've been in Southern Oregon here for about 15 years. I, I live on the creek with an orchard, uh, some pear trees, lots of wildlife uh, with my husband and two kids. Um, and this is the unceded land of the Shasta and Tequilma peoples who were forcibly removed um, in the 1850s uh, here, although some of their traditions and ways uh, definitely live on. Uh, so to give people a sense of of where I come from and and being rooted on on this earth is is important and how I begin most meetings that I facilitate as well. I love opening with that land acknowledgement um, and and helping people ground into to their bodies and their place. Um, it, maybe I can ask a quick question then, um, because naming Shasta, um, I've not been up there, but. Um, I've met so many people that speak of Mount Shasta with such reverence and such kind of eldership referred to the mountain. I don't know, um, maybe you want to go there for, for a second. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like that that spiritual strength from from mountains. I think that that we can certainly connect to that energy of of the mountains and and rivers, also uh, that are kind of the lifeblood of of our watershed and ecosystem. And uh, yeah, just drove through Shasta last week on my way back from Yosemite National Park in California, and just so grateful that there are these wild places with fresh water and intact ecosystems um and so there certainly is a special energy to to the mountain and and many rumors about uh what what is there and why that is um and and i think we see in indigenous cultures around that world that kind of reverence when i lived in flagstaff arizona the um hopi and navajo feeling that the um, they they emerged from from the Grand Canyon and and from uh, the mountain there. So uh, yeah, really really important framing and, and positioning of ourselves as yeah. part of this natural world. Also, mountains have this wonderful way of putting time into perspective for for our right. human, which I find like even more so than trees. Right. Like trees are already inviting us human beings to not take ourselves so seriously, but but mountains do so in a very significant way. Uh. Yes, yes, yeah, that historical perspective of time. Um, yeah, so to get onto my journey of kind of, um, I've, I've really had a curiosity about money and kind of from an anthropological uh, perspective, um, and and our relationships and how we care for one another mm -hmm. and uh, so I graduated from Southern Oregon University in 2007 with a degree in international economics 
Um, and my interest in that began in my early 20s. I just returned from living in Guatemala for a winter and, and seeing those vibrant markets where there's like not a price tag on anything, but people, it's about the conversation and relationship that, that brings you to an exchange. And then I came back and happened to um, move to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which is in one of the wealthiest parts of the U.S., um, beautiful, wild country, um, and happened to get a job at the Bank of Jackson Hole uh, there as executive assistant. And little did I know that just a month before, the CEO of the bank had been uh, federally indicted for embezzling um, around a million dollars over mm -hmm. the last decade. And I was just shocked. I, one of my first jobs was to copy the evidence uh, against him to go through these loan documents. And it really got me thinking, what is this sickness of the mind that would cause someone with such, such status and, and wealth and a family uh, to risk losing it all um, and, and to deceive his closest colleagues and and uh, basically, you know, forge loan documents and slightly siphon off money um, in, in this complicated scheme. And so he ended up um, yeah, going to jail uh, for that. And um, also, while I was up there sitting next to the ladies in the loan department, it dawned on me, wow, money is lent into existence. Yeah. It just okay. really was so striking. And many people don't really uh, maybe realize that and, and that money is created as debt in our modern uh, system. So I just saw this accumulation of wealth, people doing speculative lending on, on homes and, and bigger you, and like this drive. I mean, it's, it's such a simple insight, but it's really remarkable how it's hidden in plain sight. Uh, um, like the, pe yeah. even people who call themselves economists don't really think about it. Eh? But the simple piece of design that money is lent into existence and that, that then differential interest paid paid on deposits and loans, and boom, you've got a growth economy that has to grow in order to perpetuate itself. Other and, and you have a zero-sum game that needs losers. People yes. need to go bankrupt. Otherwise, the whole bill, it's not going to stack up. And <laughs> So we, we've created a system that, that makes us all run in a treadmill that when chasing Fata Morgana will never reach. Yeah? Um, and in the process, we're killing the planet. And it's two little stupid design decisions about how our monetary systems work. Exactly, exactly. It is um, really interesting <laughs> at times. And, and there are other ways. So I got interested in like micro lending, which, which has its own challenges, you know, um, because of the interest uh, charged, but really got me thinking of um, complementary currencies, things like time banking, where it's hour for hour service exchange. Um, so then I, I went back and got my degree and realized I had no idea after I graduated with, you know, um, tens of thousands of dollars in, in student loans, uh, which is pretty common here in the U.S. especially. I had no idea how to do my own personal bookkeeping or, or finance, you know, all this time in school. Uh, and, and so I took a course from uh, Barry Tesler, who's a somatic therapist and wrote uh, The Art of Money is a great book for people looking to heal some of the money trauma uh, that we all carry. And so did a great course with her that was around 2008 when, when there was another financial crisis kind of happening in, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, and then started designing and teaching six work six week workshop series for women uh, in particular called Money Metamorphosis. And I tell you, Daniel, there were so many tears and so much vulnerability for people to share and see that they're not alone in, in some of this trauma and shame around money. Um, so that was super satisfying. I remember, and then I, I just briefly, yeah. I, I remember this is not, I mean, must be more than 10 years old, 15 years old. Um, Lynn Twist wrote a book called The Soul of Money. I don't know if you ever come across that. Yeah. Uh, that was at the time really insightful for me as, in terms of understanding also philanthropy and so on. Did, did, did yes. You, uh, yeah. 
I do know that book. She was actually uh, was a guest on my podcast um, mm-hmm. in 2016. I started a podcast called Money Wise Women and interviewed over 100 women, uh, including Rianne Re- Eisler, um, Adrienne Marie Brown, and just got a lot of different perspectives on, on money. And so that was fascinating. Um, and then uh, started working for the Post Growth Institute in uh, 2017 as director of education. I'm also very involved in, in our fundraising circle. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, have just this is yeah, it's such my soul's work. It's so beautiful. Uh, that partnership with such an amazing team and uh, working closely with Donnie Clark and around transforming our um ideas about money in the economy and as well putting it into practice uh, with the offers and needs market which we can go deeper into later but I'm I'm just fascinated there's so much power in how we choose to come together as as people and and the role of group facilitators to really bring out the best and help people uh, care for one another. That, that's something that I would love to learn more about, how you as an organizational culture are structured as the Post Growth Institute. Because I, I, might, I mean, I'm just projecting onto you here. I've never talked to anybody about it, but you're decentralized. Like, I, I do know that at least on my map, Donny is somewhere in Argentina right now. Um, and yeah, so you, you decentralized also by time zone uh, some, somewhat but you managed to work together very effectively as as teams so so tell us a bit more about how that works sure it's 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 amazing i was one of the first paid employees and um donnie's visionary um, role over the last i think 14 years ago he first brought people together um and and formed this uh we are a nonprofit here in the u.s Mm -hmm. Um, And we work uh, with people from 23 countries. Uh, We have 18 volunteers and 23 paid staff. Uh, Most of us are um, Mm part-time by choice. And we use sociocracy um, as as our governance structure. So that is more decentralized where there's um, circles and directors and uh, we operate our decision making is by consent, uh, which is slightly different than consensus, you know, mm-hmm. where people are bringing it moves along quite quickly. It's a beautiful process of bringing proposals and looking for any objections uh, or clarifications. I, I, I have one experience of a practical embodied experience of sociocracy from the Finthorn carpool. I was a member of the Finthorn carpool and the way we designed the carpool and made decision about the carpool was was um with sociocracy but I'm, I'm just wondering for an organization that is decentralized how long have you been practicing it and how much because it, it, it for us when we started um it was enabling but it felt also very formulaic um and and i'm, I'm wondering that when you as a culture as an organization run it for a while does it become less formulaic? Like you just don't even notice anymore that you're you're running the the formula. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely become more natural. Um, I, I'd say we've we've been using it in some form since I uh, came on about seven years ago, and uh, it's it's been some upskilling of just having people get comfortable to bring them proposals, to make objections, to be able to work with it. Um, and then we also, uh, and and here's the book also by Ted Rao, if mm-hmm. people are yeah. interested, and we'll share this whole okay. uh, book list as well in the notes. Um, so that's called Collective power. Um, And then we also use participatory budgeting where we have a totally open spreadsheet for anyone in the organization to see exactly what people's pay rates are, their hours, um, and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And every year we kind of have an assessment of, you know, are, are your needs being met? Would you like to adjust things in any way? So it's all very relational, everything that we do. Wow. Beautiful. And and how how is that structured? Like, for example, this this review, like um like because it, the there's always such a fine balance of um enabling participation, but not dissipating energy in unnecessary discussions or something yeah. that can be and that's what so beautifully is done through sociocracy that you tease apart what needs to be discussed by whom and not 
everything being the cusper, every everyone, and then the little bit of design that if you try to reach consensus, you can go forever. But having consent and non-objection uh, is um, it, it, it is just a tiny tweak, but it works. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so a lot of it is like also surveying people so they have a chance to kind of get some information and questions out there. And then our director of personnel who came on a couple of years ago as we were uh, scaling up uh, then has that one-on-one -on -one conversation and kind of takes it back to the finance circle. So a lot of sociocracy is kind of having those connections between circles um, and people being able to uh, we also do an asset mapping kind of uh, process every year with people of not only what are your skills, like in 50 different categories, uh, but also what's your interest in actually doing this, because you might be good at this thing, but um, not really want to uh, do it at work. So that's really effective. Yeah, I mean, how often does that happen that people over and over again, just because they know something and they're good at it, but it might not be their soul fulfilling role, sort of get because oh, now you have to because it's our survival and you're back in doing kind of whatever admin uh, or, yes, um, yes. Finance stuff that nobody wants to do. No, no, it's it, 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 and to keep people, yeah, they need to also do what, what their soul um, sings for yeah. kind of thing. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the the other thing that that I only have a passing awareness of, but it sounds just like ah, here's a piece of like a key of unlocking um, collective abundance in a community. How does this office and need markets thing really work? Because I think it's it's more than time banking or anything like that. It's it's much more flexible. I, yeah, tell me. <laughs> Oops, your your sound is gone. Yes, um, yeah. So this this process, uh, uh, Donnie McClurkin, our uh, executive director, kind of created uh, in gosh about fifteen years ago in Australia. Um, his uh, yeah, and and it was really founded from appreciative inquiry. Um, and asset-based community development. So uh, Offers and Needs Markets basically a two-hour uh, group process. It can be done virtually or in person. It was really developed in person. And then of course we've adapted to Zoom as most people have. <laughs> um, and so it's a way to really uh, make visible some of the, the offers and needs uh, in, and, and involves this process where people meet to identify and exchange their offers and needs. And it can really be like a r wide range of things from the professional to, to more a personal. And I can give some examples too. Uh, but we found that this process is really such great medicine for this time of social isolation, of despair, of... Um, um, yeah, just so many challenges that, that people are facing in, in the modern uh, capitalist, late stage capitalism as, as we're seeing it here. Um, so it really is a great way if you can imagine just people um, in your neighborhood or we did it here at our grain hall, um, just people sitting around small tables and, and they go through this process of reflecting on and then um, reflecting, sharing, and then connecting uh, around first their offers. As asset-based, we found that it really helps to get people in their creative mind first about what they can offer and then move into the more vulnerable spaces of what they can share. Um, and then they'll often kind of uh, swap groups there. And, and we just had one hosted by Shareable in mm -hmm. uh, Georgia there. And they said there were people from age nine to over 70 years old there. So it's oh. great for like bridging different generations and, oh. and really creating connection. How, how do you enlist for that? Like in the sense that, um, okay, Shareable has its own network and you could just say we're doing one of those and then everybody connected to that network comes together and, and does one. But I'm sort of particularly interested in in the sort of spatial boundary around it. Like, is it neighborhood? Is it community? Is it bioregional? And where does it not become effective anymore when you, when, when you put too big of a spatial boundary around it? 
Oh my gosh, it's really surprised me, Daniel, because we've, for the last few years, we've been doing virtual public ones uh, through the uh, Post Growth Institute. So we just have random group of usually 20 or so people show up from around the world, not knowing each other. And there is like a magic and a synchronicity that happens when people open up and you get inspired by what other people are sharing. Um, and so it works fine with strangers uh, from around the world. We kind of use a spreadsheet uh, virtually during the actual event. So people are able to follow up afterwards. And really, it deeply gives them a sense um, of, of greater and we found this through our surveys after each event, greater confidence in expressing themselves, uh, greater trust and and a um, greater sense of well-being just to connect in that way. So while I find a lot of joy in kind of the local place based things mm -hmm. or we've had it run um, in Chicago by Mike Strode, one of our key trainers and partners he has a time bank there called Colonet Collaborative. Um, so he ran one a few years ago, in-person conference around the food supply and distribution kind of um, systems. And he said it was a great disruptor because people came just with their thing they were expecting to, to pitch or give. But because each person was able to speak about offers and or needs um, on behalf of their organization or, and or themselves. Um, yeah, it really kind of broke up some of the the status uh, kind of barriers that, that were there and, mm -hmm. and got people um, connected as humans. Yeah. I mean, that's so much what it's all about, isn't it? Like creating opportunities for people to build real human relationship, to learn something together. So, and, and, and to, to build trust through building relationship. And through just like I so often, even within a given community, we don't even know what people's real gifts and skills are. Uh, and so it just to be able to map for yourself. I didn't know that I have a plumber right next door and I was looking for plumbers all my life uh, kind of thing. Uh, um, it's 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 remarkable how like somehow we now have to reinvent mechanism to create, recreate community that that maybe in the past was just naturally grown because we were more, more place bound. Um, the, like as you were describing the international meetings, I was just wondering, because I'm, I'm noticing that there is a demographic now that joins online learning journeys. Wonderful people. But what's alarming me a little bit is that they're all kind of a bit gray haired and and yeah. there is a little bit of that sense that they might have had a family, but now they're lonely or alone, or they might not have had a family and they're lonely and alone, and that they come to these events also absolutely rightfully so to to connect to to meet people. And, and that there's a real need for people to have that. And, and I could imagine that also because surely many of them have all sorts of skills. And so something as simple as that, offering a space where these people can even virtually support each other um, in whatever their skills is, is beautiful. Like, have, have you ever written up like vignettes of the kind of magic that happens? Yeah, yeah, I've definitely been collecting stories um, and we have trained about uh, over 400 people since 2020 in eight different cohorts we've brought through this facilitator training and certification program. I think we have close to 20 people certified. And so it's it's really, yeah, I, uh, people are using it in every continent, uh, different cultures, ages, focuses. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of heartwarming stories. And it's really shown me that there is kindness and generosity at the heart of, of humans. And we want to make meaningful contributions, whether it's advice. And it's not only the people in the room, we're all connected with this whole web of other relationships. And so people are so willing to connect and, and share. And, and there's definitely a lot of stories um, and I'll just show you, mm -hmm. we had uh, some training participants give examples of, of how they hope to use these. Um, actually, just this weekend, this young adult cancer survivor ran one in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we, I, I can tell you more about some of the ways it's been used in natural disasters. It can be kind of more casual. 
um, a lot of uh, people using mutual aid um, networks or time banks have found it really useful as kind of the social layer of how to uh, connect people and build that culture of trust, which has been um, kind of uh, disintegrating with with um, some of our modern uh, capitalist world. So you can see it's it's really a, a wide range of, of ways that people are, are using the process. I, I was just seeing the, the eco-village thing. As you were speaking, I thought, and just drop that as a as a seed and let's see where that where it goes. Um I've been helping Gaia education um rebalance after they've been a bit unbalanced by having had a CEO for a bit too long. Like she did wonderful work building them up, but then she as often happened uh, with organizations sort of overstayed a bit and and then the main funder left. And so they they they're currently reinventing themselves beautifully with co-CEOs, um, uh, um, Sally and Pedro, and and they're regaining their more activist community supportive stance that they've held for so many years, over 20 years, almost 20 years now. And in, in that context, I've been trying to um, bring other people in our wider movement, so to speak, um, closer to them. So for example, Jeremy Lent now runs a course with them that I like I introduced them and and I'm starting to run course. And the, the thought is maybe um, the Post Growth Institute and Guy Education could do a collaboration to run an office and needs market training or something, um, because I know that their kind of constituency in different parts of the world would be turbocharged by something like this. So it, it's it's a kind of a natural thing to do. I don't know. Oh, I love that. Happy to explore that. And yeah. uh, and definitely, if people are interested who are listening, uh, you can find out at offersandneeds.com. Uh, and we do, um, we can uh, facilitate these events uh, for people as well. And we're offering consultancy now as well, uh, Daniel. So that could be a good um, way for you or some of the people on the team to kind of begin running these uh practices and we have a full like toolkit uh, uh, that's very thorough with all the templates so you know what's cool it's so intuitive and it's mm -hmm. like an ancient indigenous way that we are just kind of relearning um, and oh that there is more here right here that that I know um, that that I can have my needs met that I can express them safely and um, and be able to tap into the wisdom of the community um, I wanted to share about, we, we ran this training in person for the first uh, time. We've been doing it virtually and we got a grant from the Oregon Community Foundation and this uh, winter ran it with a group of, uh, from the Native American community here. And it was so beautiful because the best part of that was hearing them opening this conversation of indigenous practices of community care. And there was just so much there from the way they have um, ceremonies, from what they do when uh, say a child is sick or has some, some troubles and bringing the mother and child into this healing space and having potluck and food and contributions, mm -hmm. how they care for their elders and how they honor um, the earth itself with ceremonies of reciprocity. Um, here there was um, a woman named Agnes Baker Pilgrim who started the 13 Grandmothers Council mm -hmm. a couple decades back. And mm -hmm. she, um, a Tequilma woman who brought uh, our sacred sal salmon ceremony back and, and from her relatives who remembered that. And, and so there's a place on the Rogue River here where every year they have this salmon and, and part of it is the first one that's caught is, is then returned by a diver who like goes in a brave warrior who goes deep into the, the falls there and, and returns that salmon to the, uh, they believe is, is kind of the salmon people under water and so it's it's beautiful and of course uh in the book braiding sweetgrass robin wall kimmer talks a lot about these indigenous ways of reciprocity with the land and and one another yeah i mean that's for me this is so what we need to rediscover um like i had a wonderful yeah. conversation with um tyson Yanka porter where he shared about what boundaries mean 
in the way that Aboriginal culture organized regionally across not just the Australian continent, but but even up into the islands um, and how these regional tribal systems were completely like they would gather some large distances away for larger gatherings in a kind of sociocratic structure to some extent. And what really blew my mind was that they would, the, the law of the land, the story of the land, the, the song lines, what, the, what, what was important to know about a place was taken to these meetings and taught to somebody who would live like a long distance away and always two or three people. So that law would be safe should something happen in a place and all memory of the stories would be wiped out. I mean, what, what level of cultural foresight is that to have over 10,000s of years established a system of maintaining the stories that the landscape needs to tell so we can keep learning from them. But just... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And and we have people may have heard of the potlatch here in the Pacific Northwest and the tribes that would, you know, um, you were measured your wealth by how much you had to give away. And there would be these ceremonies and feasts of, of potlatch and, and it would increase your social status, that kind of generosity. And so I feel like we we want that feeling of belonging deep down, right? It's like, just so at our core and, and why I think many people are drawn to intentional uh, community. I certainly have been myself over the years and just feel like there is that, that desire to be known and to share our gifts and also feel like in those challenging times that we are taken care of as well. For me, this offers a needs market. It could be potentially even more centrally powerful to what I've been dancing with regarding um, how do we uh, people have misunderstood over and over again what this regenerative cultures thing is trying to express people keep like many of the kind of now that it's become trendy to put the adjective regenerative to everything those people who want to sell the new as the advisors for whatever, you know, they they need to sell it as ah, oh, this is this utopia in the future, don't you see? And we need to define it, and then we need to backcast it, and then we need to implement it. And and what I keep saying is no, 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 and it's right here, right now. Like otherwise, we we're giving away what this impulse could mean because if if you present it like that, then it will just be a fad. Then somebody will come along and call it thriving or flourishing or whatever next for another round of consultancy making a bit of money. Uh -huh. And but if we anchor it in life itself, in every cell of our body, there is regeneration going on. In our bones have regenerated over the last seven years completely. Um ecosystems around us constantly regenerate and destruction and the collapse of something that no longer fits and is actually destructive to the system is part of regeneration. It's a healthy process to have collapse of certain things. Um, and if we, then I'm coming to a point here. Um, if we, we then kind of say, okay, regenerative impulses are if we are nature which we so obviously are and it's only a story that separates us from her um then as lila june has put so beautifully in her, her work we we have that capacity to be architects of abundance to be regenerators to be regenerative keystone species and so what what we actually need to do in each place is to fan the embers of regeneration that are already there. And, and that's where I feel the office and need, needs market is actually coming in because it's it's saying there are so many people who care, so many people who heal, who hold in custody, who celebrate um, local law, local history, local uniqueness, um, who celebrate diversity in all its forms. And all of those people are already there. They are regenerative culture. And what we need to do is to create mechanisms like the office and need market for these people to find each other 
and within the bound of a, of a given locality and territory, begin to just live from that other story. That, does that does that resonate? Oh my gosh, so much. Yes, yes, definitely feel that type of the cultural layer, you know, that we can talk about the systems, of course, need to change and the way money is printed and how, you know, all, all of these things, philanthropy and finance happen. And so I, I've definitely spent time thinking there, but how, how do we ground it into our communities and, and that personal experience of, of trust and, and healing that happens um, is, is so Amazing. I don't know. You've probably heard of, uh, let's see, I've got a stack of books here that, oh, Attuned by Thomas Hubel, the Austrian man who talks about um, healing collective trauma. And that's what I see again and again at these offers and needs markets. People may show up thinking it's a networking event, but deep down the way it's held with a land acknowledgement, time and silence to reflect, you know, um, honoring uh, people's, uh, yeah, just an inclusive event that that lets people relax in their nervous systems. And then amazing healing can happen. Sometimes people break down in tears. I thought I had nothing to offer. I'm only 20 years old. I've seen this happen where people are just asked to reflect on their offers. It can be so painful and challenging. And, and yet um, gently we can come through to supporting those people to explore what they love, what passions they have, and, and really expanding their sense of what's valuable too, right? We've been so pigeonholed into what has a market value, what's the dollar, what do I do for work and for pay, and helping people just expand uh, their sense of what's valuable and hearing what other people needs can really stimulate that. So it, it really does heal, you know, I, there are three ways that the Offers and Needs Market um, offers uh, a healing space. And the first is this exclusivity, you know, it goes to that belonging that people want to feel. And so the way that we can open the, the space and, and prepare and, and design it in a way where people can feel welcomed and, and like they're visible and engaged. Um, and the second way is, is when they share their offers, uh, healing some of this trauma I just spoke of with mm -hmm. that woman in one of our events, feeling like they're not valuable. I hear this often from even people who are also re retired, you know, they can feel a little stuck or if they're unemployed. Um, and the third way is this needs, which is pretty deep to express our needs because at some level, some of us have trauma of not feeling worthy of love or care. Mm -hmm. And certainly our, our modern culture um, can, can perpetrate that story of, of, of scarcity and, and not deserving love. And so I feel like when there's a lot that can be done personally and individually with our own practices, but then to have the group spaces to put this, to practice speaking our needs, for example, is, is just transformative. Again, over and over, I keep thinking, like as, as you were speaking, I was thinking of my experience with the way of counsel and how that is, is a space where the same thing happens. Or my experience of um, working with Joanna Macy and the work that reconnects and um, or working with any form of right, rites of passage um, in groups. But they, there seems to be one thing in common that it is actually that these deep transformational processes in which we have the time to open up to share um a little bit more about ourselves and our concerns and our fears and our worries and by doing so give permission to others to do the same and create that collective healing of saying oh okay i'm not the only one because that's that's where the magic starts happening that you kind of go oh, i thought i was depressed because the world like because we're killing life um and then you kind of go, <laughs> well, that 80 year old granny is just as depressed about it. And that 14 year old that I thought was all about this. Yeah? And, and suddenly you kind of go, ah, it's systemic and it's life talking through us. There's a, yeah? and, and then suddenly, or, or like what, what I was from deeply from personal experience, the first time you sit in a council circle and the council has been really deep and suddenly you pick up the piece and you say something. And afterwards, there's this silence where the what you said lands in the circle, and and you suddenly realize, 
that didn't come from me. I didn't know I knew that. I never thought that. I never said that. Where, where, the, where, where the heck did that come from? And, and experiencing that is so fundamental because then you know that collective intelligence and and group being are not some fancy idea of some woo-woo -woo person. They're, they're actually real and we're capable of, of, of perceiving them and working with them. Uh -huh. Oh, and we're hungry for those spaces uh, on a deep level. And so few people get those, whether it's at work or personally. Um, and, and we start every work meeting at the Post Growth Institute with a personal check-in, just getting people's voices in. And, and the questions range from the, the serious to the more, you know, what's your least favorite food kind of thing. And, and how we set the tone of, of getting everyone's voice in the space. And there is a lot to learn from indigenous cultures and, and the way of the council and the, the circle and how we bring out the best in people. And I find too that one of the biggest surprises when people take the training and experiences our processes is the use of silence and really letting people reflect in silence when there's a question asked. And um, it so helps, uh, you know, for the introverts, for people who need more time processing to feel honored. And, and we even asked you, would anyone like more time? And, and people can, can let us know and often do. And so it's like to really have that silence instead of the loudest voice and the first person mm -hmm. jumping in and, and that feeling of everyone often having a speaking order where everyone could, could have a voice and certainly they can pass. But I feel like that is, is so needed. It's like, um, so that's why we find group facilitation is one of the, you know, often undervalued skills in our world to be able to bring people together with whether it's a few people intimately or a large group. And I know you do some of this work and, and to really bring out that collective wisdom and opportunities for healing is, is so important. You, is that part of the Post Growth Institute's training? Like, do, do you train your staff in facilitation or do you pick facilitators as your staff? Or, um, and also, do you offer kind of community capacity building or capability building for um, facilitation? Yeah, yes to all, all of that. Yeah, people experience it through our programs. Our uh, fellowship is in its uh, third year, as you probably know. And and so we use these techniques in, in all of these kind of facilitation spaces. We also just relaunched our Post Growth, Post Growth Alliance, um, mm -hmm. which has, I think, 30 or so organizations from around the world. And so they're all experiencing our, our kind of meeting style. Um, and and certainly we uh, we now are offering more consultancy as well because we are doing things in a really unique way and have some tried and true uh, practices and templates for people to use. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You've done it for a while and you've done it. You've done it with a big team or big bigish team successfully. Yeah. And that's that's um, just sharing that with so many organizations that are on that journey of how how do we. Um, like it's it's that thing that I learned at Finthorn, the, the the good old triangle between task, process, and relationship. Uh, and in all three of them, you need to find balance and you have the right capabilities and people to actually catch themselves when you run off. Like it's it's good to take your deep dive into relationship or into process. But task is also important, <laughs> and so and and so. It, but then some people push everything towards task and overrun relationships, um, or 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 co-opt process in order to get task done. Uh, and and I have a sense that yeah. like also from knowing Lonnie, uh, uh, Donny a bit, um, I it's just a culture that you've you've created. So that, so that sharing that is is really powerful. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and it's it's fractal as well. You know, Adrienne Marie Brown um, talks about this in, in her book, Emergent Strategies, which I recommend. She also has a great one on facilitation called Holding Change. Um, so really these fractals of the way that we gather, um, celebrate rituals of grief or celebration, 
um, really bring this kind of, uh, there was one sociologist who called it the community effervescence mm -hmm. um, is, is brought forth through these things. So when we do practice, even in our, you know, small circle meetings of eight people in the offers and needs market circle, just by starting with these ways of checking in and doing the land acknowledgement. And, and then the final bit, if, if people are listening, I, I hope this is valuable um, to end our meeting with learnings and appreciations. Yeah. And um, that can include suggested improvements. Like I really wish you would have put that in the chat or, you know, it can be like anything from the small to the large, but to, yeah, end with that kind of appreciation. And people often feel so energized after our meetings. They're like, whoa, this is unusual. <laughs> and how, I mean, how do you keep it crisp? Because the, 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 the danger of the more participatory way of working is, is that it takes, or it feels sometimes like yeah. it takes longer. What it actually, it doesn't because you don't run into the detours that you that you otherwise have to take the time over. Eh? But but to slow people down in this busy world where also the expectations constantly ask you to go, come on, get going. Eh? And this this false, like I bumped into this even today again in a conversation with a friend, like how we keep perpetuating this false dualism between theory and practice. Oh, we're just talking, that's not doing. But if you talk in this way and build culture in this way that's deep doing that's not just talking yeah. so right yeah. yeah you know there we have an agenda for for every meeting too everyone sees it it's laid out what what our plans are we certainly adapt as needed what i've really learned from facilitating all these years um, since 2007 i really started group facilitation is this um, structure and flow. And, and you've probably seen this in permaculture principles and just the ways in which you have the agenda and the, um, you know, kind of healthy masculine structure. And, uh, and then you can find safety in the flow within that and the adaptation that may be needed um, or tending to someone who has some big emotions coming up and yet you have that structure to, to come back to and and then we all kind of have that culture of expecting oh we'll have a time at the end to check out and share our learning so i'll save this bit that i was wanting to say so it's amazing it is um self-regulating too i find that on that level of when people's nervous systems are relaxed and they're not anxious they know you as the facilitator are watching the time and have a plan that people really can um drop into that wisdom and and mm -hmm. also only speak when necessary you know there's much less of that trying to you know prove yourself or or anything that people really are um yeah kind of and and moving towards you know okay a task what was just said there what do we need to do you know what decision was just made so there's certainly some roles which help within a meeting of like the scribe and and different ways in which we can kind of keep things effective and efficient while while being really heart centered and one question that just came to mind is with this big team like you you're center and you're registered in the us as a um, 501 but um how mm -hmm so much of this work is culturally nuanced and it will be slightly different in France or in Turkey or in Brazil. Um, have you have you got to that level that, that there are some teams that are actually doing this work in their own way in other countries or is it, would you say it's still quite a North American center of gravity organization? I would say we have done, um, really put a lot of effort into the re-indigenization and uh, decolonization of, of our minds and practices and um, including uplifting those in the global south. And um, uh, so I would say that has, yeah, it's been that influence, that back and forth. And I feel like we've really found some of the human elements that that cut across some of the cultural, geographic, racial, um, demographic differences uh, with people. Um, most of the people who have come through our training kind of, uh, it's, it's a wide variety of ages, but really in that kind of 
um, 18 to 40 year old uh, sector is the biggest. About 75% are women who come through our facilitation training and also just reaching where more than half are uh, people of color. And so we really find that this is already something that's been happening in their communities as far as mutual aid and these other ways of caring for one another. So I feel like, um, yeah, it's definitely built a culture of of trust and, and care through our work. It's so fascinating that all of that, building a culture of trust and care, is so much more central. Like, I just think how interesting how we're not really talking about post-growth in the sense of, oh, let's talk about post-growth. No, we're talking about relationships, about how to be with each other, how to value each other and collectively make decisions and and share abundance. Um, and ultimately, that is what happens if you stop being obsessed with growth um, in the in the current economic way. Uh, um, so, and... Where, where do you see the organization developing? What would, what's your dream um, in terms of the, the next few years? Or you are you concerned? I mean, we can also go into that more, like we're, we're now at a time where much of what our work is, is helping people through giving them the resilience and the human relationship skills to whether what might be coming to all of our places sooner or later. Right, right, yeah. And and there's been so much growing growing interest in post-growth and degrowth. And um, traditionally it was more kind of academic, um, much more popular in Europe, I'd say. Um, and, and so kind of bringing that into uh, a more, um, yeah, uh, decolonized, uh, perspective has been the aim of our, our fellowship over the last three years. Um, we, yeah, we are kind of moving into this consulting phase and uh, really being able to help organizations and, and groups, uh, community leaders uh, more effectively um, bring this culture in into their activities. Um, and so I also see the offers and needs market is just expanding really organically with more and more people once they experience it. It's like uh, really lights them up. And so, like I said, people can learn that process if you'd like through the consultancy um, and and really just uh, more and more social enterprise, you know, that we have been funded by grants and that's had its own challenges when, when some of those larger grants abruptly and um, we've we've had to adapt accordingly and and continue to um, kind of approach that from from a relational way too of really finding those good matches and more long term relationship with with funders. So I imagine that we'll continue to to share and demonstrate uh, what we've learned and be able to ultimately. Um, you know, to tie it in also to kind of the, the natural world uh, to more um, equitably circulate money and power and resources in our local communities. Mm -hmm. um, so that our mission is really that grounded in our own embodied practices and inspired by the wisdom of natural systems and indigenous ways of being and doing that we can restore the human and planetary well-being by um, uplifting and evolving approaches that that do this circulation. Um, so a lot of it is uh, also networks of, of trust and organizations that can really support each other like the Post-Growth Alliance. And so I feel like there is such a need to, um, yeah, reorient towards what's valuable um, and and I, I love the work of the Wellbeing Economic uh, mm -hmm. Alliance, uh, of course, and we have donut economics um, happening in different uh, locations now as well. Um, we're also a member of the New Economy Coalition. They've been um, part of our uh, network for a while. And so there's lots of organizations kind of looking at different levels of things. And I hope that more and more people disengage from kind of the extractive, um, 
it was called the tapeworm economy by the Catherine Austin Fitz uh, years ago. And, and that really stuck with me, right? It's like parasitic and yeah. just sucking our lifeblood uh, out of people and planets. So yeah, how do, how do we reorient towards looking towards one another, towards um, more cooperative uh, kind of development and, and able to, um, yeah, kind of evolve from being just consumers to more engaged participants uh, in in our world. Mm. Just maybe for both for me and the sake of other people who might like, sometimes this, one can get triggered by the word consultancy um, in in a way yeah. of uh, or commercializing. Yeah? Um, yeah. I just want to give you a, a, an opportunity to to kind of. Um, because I, I hear much more that you're offering your experience of how to do this work to organizations that want to do this work in other parts of the world. Um, and of course, you need to somehow also um, run the organization and, and put a price tag to it. But I, I just, so what kind of organizations do you consult to and and what about and in, and in, in, in the, like, yeah tell me a bit more yeah yeah great question um well donnie mcclurkin's really been our kind of lead consultant and uh worked with over 200 nonprofit groups so we really see nonprofits and cooperatives as as kind of a essential for for the post-growth uh economy and so we definitely look to work with groups and or networks that are aligned with with our values and and share these practices um in this way um, and and be able to customize it. A lot of it is really um, just hearing the specific um, needs that people have and and being able to um, adapt what we have uh, to to those circumstances. And so we find it's so useful to really, um, yeah, just engage and and again, you know, have those templates and checklists and agendas and all those kinds of things. But really, it's about um, often we also use the surveying, say after offers and needs markets events, to then review that data with the facilitator and be able to to give them a sense of of possible improvements. So I find it's just like co-learning together is like we learn as well every time we we connect during consultancy and sometimes adapt things uh, accordingly. So that's that's kind of our approach is very relational. So it's 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 really more in a role of um, a, another practitioner organization walking alongside with an organization for a while to share learning rather than an organization tailored to offer advice but never do it themselves and because that's a big difference exactly yeah exactly yeah we've been living this and now we're ready to to share it yeah. even deeper beautiful well this has been really amazing and really enjoyed this conversation we're already like i sometimes i go for it ever but sometimes it's actually sweet to keep it by an hour because more people watch it that way that's for sure um is there uh -huh. anything else that you you have in mind that 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 you you feel like oh, i would love to talk about this but we haven't had a chance yet hmm. Gosh, we've really covered a nice um, journey of things from the big scale to, to the very personal um, and just feel called to acknowledge also how much grief there is in the world today. Mm -hmm. Like we touched on the healing that's possible, the trauma, how that impacts us and, and how we show up um, and and just that grief of loss of, of so much that's happening and and how we can um, support each other and and really offer that that mutual aid and support and um, also many people with um, you know natural disasters happening. We saw this um, here in Southern Oregon in 2020. We had a big like fire tornado come through the town in a, in a day. The Almeda fire in September. Um, it was very hot and dry, no water left in the fire hydrants and thousands of, of buildings just a mile from my house here were 
were lost, lost. And so there's been a beautiful outpouring of mutual aid after that, you know, we had a couple of weeks with no power and people were, um, yeah, just set up a, a mutual aid station. And there was that list of offers and needs that they would have every day and share on social media for people to come and, and help. And so I feel that there is um, so many people living on, on the brink financially and, and with meeting their basic needs. And so to really have practices like this ahead of time before those disasters strike, where you can have a sense of who's in your neighborhood with the medical skills or um, other things that may be needed in these emergency situations, mm -hmm. uh, that it really is such an important uh, practice and, and helps us feel better resourced, uh, greater belonging, and and like that we can um, adapt and and respond in ways that are intelligent and and supportive even in challenging situations. So just wanted to acknowledge, of course, so many of the difficulties happening in the world, um, people displaced from their ancestral homelands and um, trying to navigate the, the modern world as well with, with so many devices and things. And so I feel like these indigenous ways of, of caring for ourselves and one another is, is crucial for, for our well-being. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's like I'm reminded that in a conversation I had with, with Andreas Weber, um, he came back to this, the fundamental kindness of life and generosity of life and how he was quite somehow quite dark in the sense of a more sort of dark mountain project like we've caused too much damage for this to have a happy ending um, kind of take but somehow there was this deeper beauty of human relationships to each other to place that without attachment to outcomes there is still so much kindness generosity beauty and um, relationality um, and the gift of even being able to experience even in those despairing moments and to some extent those people you named already have had much of the stuff that we still cling on to and hope we can maintain stripped away from them. Uh, and more people hope, yeah, possibly including all of us um, in one way or another, will will have that. And so building these practices that that enable us to, when surprise happens, because it will, say, and what next? And then be surprised by the positive surprises that like after a fire tornado comes through, it's like when I read Don Donnie's stories of the bike messengers and everything, I was crying at the distance. I was with you there for, for how beautiful um, humans came together to actually help each other. And and so, and, and, and also what I'm, by many wise people I get the chance to talk with lately reminded of, like, let's not forget of how powerful the, the ally is that we have when we understand that we are life. Like, that li life also knows that we've been rather silly younger brothers um, not knowing how to behave on this earth. And, and so... I sometimes feel in all this negative talk about collapse and don't you see, and if you're not with us, then you're against us in this collapsist world. Um, I, I, I feel like even that is too saying, oh yeah, my science is right. Uh, um, may, maybe there is something even more magical at, at work. And I just feel in a beautiful way that that the Post Growth Institute has, has, has tried to bring that magic into the world um, effectively. So thank, thank you for the work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if people are interested, uh, you can find our website at postgrowth.org. Um, and also feel free to reach out to me at crystal at postgrowth.org. And again, offersandneeds.com um, as well. And yeah, there is so much wisdom to to um, also have, have a recent metaphor from the natural world. I, I went river rafting in a wild and scenic area of Oregon with my family. And, and it was like, 
that river is pu pulling you towards towards the ocean and and there's not a whole lot of pushing that has to happen you know it's it's kind of like watching the the water listening to the water noticing things and and just pointing your boat in that way and and to me it felt like such a metaphor for for leadership and how to navigate the world and you do need to avoid certain you know challenging things in the river and and certainly need to act quickly at times to to get uh where you want to go to the shore but but there is that sense of just being pulled by something by life by something greater than ourselves and and trusting uh that wisdom and and following our intuition and i find the more you know there's a lot of great work around somatics now so that we can uh, tune in to the wisdom of our body and and then when we have those practices across an organization or community that then we really can tap into this this greater human potential and um, navigate what's what's coming yay yes to that thank absolutely you. thank you so much yes. wonderful and have a have a wonderful rest of the day for you and evening here for me and yeah thank let's you. let's I'll, let's Come, come back on that um, weaving a collaboration between Guy Education and the Post Growth Institute. Uh, I think that would be a natural. Let's make it happen. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Lots of love. Uh, All right. Do you want to stop the recording? And then okay, we'll... yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> there we go.